Today we will be discussing the French Chateau, its origin, and a number of famous chateaus created during the French Renaissance. The word chateau encompasses a variety of residential architecture, from fortified castles to palaces and mansions. The word chateau actually translates to castle. That's because chateaus were originally fortified castles built for defense in regions where there was a lot of conflict. Many fortified castles were built during medieval times and served as areas of defense for French royals and nobility. One example of a fortified castle style chateau is shown on the top left. This defensive type of chateau typically featured thick walls, small windows, and crenellated parapets. In the late 1400s, France regained control of their country, and the Renaissance began. The royalty and nobility could now reign freely and safely in Paris again, and therefore they left their fortified chateaus behind. So what were the French to do with all of these chateaus? The fortification style was no longer useful. However, many royals and nobility had gained an appreciation for the countryside living. For this reason, many fortified chateaus were renovated or built new to serve as luxurious country homes and palaces, and one particular king led the way. Not only did King Francois Premier inspire the concept of a chateau as a palace or mansion, he was a major player in bringing the Italian Renaissance to France. Royals and nobility wealthy enough to travel, like Francois, were inspired by Renaissance art, architecture, and gardens in Italy. To decorate his royal residences, Francois brought artists and craftsmen from Italy and imported Italian works of art to adorn the walls. Shortly after coming to the throne, Francois invited Leonardo da Vinci to come work in France. The king's style influenced others. The French nobility began taking up the Italian style for their own architectural projects and artwork. The most desirable area of the French countryside was the Loire Valley. This area was within easy traveling distance to Paris and featured fertile land, a mild climate, great hunting, trees to produce lumber for building, and the Loire River, which was not only beautiful, but helped to transport people and goods. Along with Paris, the Loire Valley saw the finest flourishing of Renaissance architecture in France. In 1490, King Charles VIII purchased Chateau Quelusse and transformed it from a medieval fortress into a Renaissance chateau and summer residence for the kings. The facade was built from pink brick and local limestone, typical of the 15th century construction. All that remains of the original fortification is the watchtower, visible on the right. When Francois Premier came to power, the Clos Luce became the house symbolizing the Renaissance movement in France. Francois invited many famous painters, architects, and poets to reside here. In 1516, Francois invited Leonardo da Vinci to come to France and serve as his premier engineer, architect, and painter. The chateau was connected by an underground tunnel to a nearby castle where Francois resided. The king would visit daily to discuss ideas for his design projects. Da Vinci spent the last three years of his life here, collaborating with Francois. Construction of the Chateau de Chambord began in 1519. The original plans have been lost. However, it is theorized that Chambord was a joint effort between Italian architect Domenico da Cortona and Leonardo da Vinci, who was living nearby. The chateau was designed as a hunting palace for King Francois Premier. Here, he would entertain and impress guests with his royal power and wealth. The central towers are laid out in a crown design, stretching towards the heavens. A fleur-de-lis, a symbol of the French monarchy, 
crowns the highest central tower, demonstrating the king's closeness to the gods. Despite the grandeur and effort put into this residence, Francois only visited for a couple of weeks per year to entertain. The influence from the Italian Renaissance is strong. The inhabitable levels are visually separated by a molded frame or body molding running horizontally across the entire facade. Vertically, flattened out pillars or pilasters appear to support the horizontal molding. This layout is called the Italian style grid pattern. The facade is made of carved stone with slate applied to the roof. Due to occasional snow, roofs usually had two slopes with dormer windows. The Italian Renaissance style, combined with Gothic elements and building materials and techniques local to France, came to be seen as the French Renaissance style. Following the example of Chambord, other Loire Valley castles were either rebuilt or built to emulate this look. Here we see a view of King Francois Premier's bedroom at Chambord. Furniture for the chateau had to meet three design criteria. First, it must be comfortable. Secondly, it must be prestigious. And third, it must be portable. During the Renaissance, the king was a nomad. He traveled across France with his court, moving from one seat of power to the next and transporting furniture and decor to be installed along with him. Furniture and decor were only present in the chateau during his hunting visits. The bed was the most important part of the Renaissance interior. Not only did beds serve the functional purpose of sleeping, they were a statement piece of the owner's power and wealth, as only the rich could afford beds. Beds were usually four-poster with a canopy over top. The frame was made from dark wood and covered with ornate carvings. Here you can see four wooden finials rising from the top of the canopy. Heavy draperies were hung from the top and sides of the bed for warmth, protection from insects, and decorative style. The bed is on a platform, not only for dramatic effect, but to separate it from the cold palace floor. Tapestries cover the walls. Most of them provide a decorative pattern backdrop to the bedroom. On the right, we have a large accent tapestry in the style of a scenic painting. The tapestries provide beauty, warmth, and could easily be rolled up and transported to the king's next destination. Here are some other common types of Renaissance furniture which could have been seen in the chateau. As you can see, French Renaissance furniture typically showcased architectural details like columns, pilasters, pediments, and cornices. On the left, we have the cassonet, also known as a trunk. It was an essential furniture piece. As wardrobes were not invented yet, this is where the king would store his clothing and other personal belongings for easy transportation. Cassonets were often decorated with carving, painting, and gilding, and feature biblical or mythological scenes. On the right, we have the cacatoire. Cacte means to chat. This chair was specifically designed for women. To accommodate multi-layered skirts, the arms were designed in a U-shape, and the seat of the chair narrowed towards the back. Usually, these chairs were made from carved walnut and the seat was topped with a cushion for comfort. This cacatoire has turned arms and carved scenes on the back panel. Despite the level of embellishment, you can see the chair is lightweight and easy to transport. Next, we'll take a look at Chateau de Fontainebleau, another one of Francois Premier's chateaus where he would have traveled with his furniture. Chateau de Fontainebleau is located just outside of Paris. King Francois Premier transformed the medieval royal hunting lodge into a Renaissance palace in two phases. 
The first phase began in 1528 under architect Jules Le Breton. The picture demonstrates all the additions Le Breton put into place. He preserved the medieval structure of the king's apartments, but incorporated them into a new Renaissance-style oval courtyard, or Cor Oval. The medieval gatehouse was replaced by the Porte Dore, shown on the right. The Porte Dore was composed of grand loggias, stacked one above the other, modeled after the palaces of Naples and Urbino. The Lucarne windows with triangular froton would become commonly seen in French Renaissance architecture. The second phase also began in 1528. In this phase, Francois constructed the Gallery of Francois Premier. The gallery allowed him to walk directly from his apartment to the Chapel of Trinitier. While the exterior of the chateau is luxurious and surrounded by the forest, stunning gardens, and a moat, it looks simple compared to the interior. Francois brought a sizable amount of artists from Italy to create the gallery, including architect Sebastiano Serlio and painter Rosso Fiorentino. This became the first great gallery in France, and the Fountain Blue became the hub of artistic Renaissance activity. Francois attained his goal of creating an atmosphere of abundance and excess. The gallery is filled with frescoes, detailed stucco designs, woodwork, and gilding. Twelve rectangular frescoes, glorifying the king, line the walls, framed by high-relief sculpted stucco. Common motifs include nymphs, garlands, scrolls, baskets, fruit, and Michelangelo-inspired nudes. The paintings were inspired from stories from Homer, Ovid, and other classical authors popular among humanists of the time. The incorporation of grotesques and the elongated graceful bodies in the stucco work and paintings transformed the gallery into a new Rome. The lower portion of the wall is covered in decorative wood paneling. The designs include decorative strap work along with the F for Francois and other symbols of the king. The ceilings are covered in carved, gilded woodwork. This decadent level of detail and embellishment is what French Renaissance interiors would become known for. Chateau Chenancieux is located in the village of Chenancieux in the Loire Valley. The chateau was originally a defensive medieval castle surrounded by a moat. Over the years, most of the fortified castle was destroyed and a mill over the water was added. In 1515, Chamberlain Thomas Poyer and his wife, Catherine Bruconnet, took ownership. Catherine demolished all that the castle keep and built a Renaissance castle on the foundation of the former mill. It is believed architect Domenico de Cortona, who was also involved in Chateau Chambord, was consulted for the design. Catherine hosted lavish parties and entertained nobility, including King Francois Premier. In 1535, Francois seized the chateau, and the chateau became part of the royal estate. Francois's daughter-in-law, Catherine de Medici, requested the chateau as a personal retreat from her husband, King Henri II. However, Henri defiantly gifted the chateau to his mistress, Dion de Portier. In 1555, Dion commissioned architect Philibert de Lhomme to build the arch bridge over the river Cher, joining the chateau to the opposite bank. Dion also built a formal garden with flowers, vegetables, and fruit trees. The gardens were laid out along the banks of the river, but buttressed from flooding by stone terraces. The gardens were laid out in four triangles. 
After Henri died, Diane was forced to hand over the chateau to Catherine de' Medici in 1559. Catherine de' Medici expanded the gardens, added additional rooms, a service wing, and built the Grand Gallery, which extends along the bridge to cross the entire river. The gallery was used as a grand ballroom, and Catherine hosted many parties here. The gallery was designed by Jean Boulon. Once a small chateau, the Chateau and Garden of Vaux-le-Vicomte is located in Malcy, France, 30 miles southeast of Paris. It was purchased and renovated by Nicolas Fouquet, King Louis XIV's Superintendent of Finances. Fouquet was a patron of the arts and wanted to build a chateau to reflect his great ambition. In 1656, he hired architect Louis Laveau, landscape architect André Lenant, and the painter decorator Charles Lebrun. Their collaboration marked the beginning of the Louis XIV style, combining architecture, interior design, and landscape design. With its classic symmetry and its great gardens, it was the model that inspired many other French Baroque chateaus. At vaux le vicomte André Lenat, the landscape architect, created the original expression of the Jardin à la Française, the French aesthetic of a formal garden. Instead of viewing the garden as an intimate, safe haven, gardens became about scale and ambition. The garden was the dominant structure of the property, stretching nearly a mile and a half, designed with a strong central axis that extended from the rear of the chateau to the horizon. At first glance, from the rear steps of the chateau, the garden seems symmetrical and ordered. In reality, each side is different, but by manipulating the mathematical tools of perspective and balance, André Lenot achieved harmony. From the top of the grand staircase, the entire garden appears to be revealed in a single glance. However, carefully orchestrated changes in level meant that pools, cascades, and a canal gradually and surprisingly revealed themselves as one walks through the gardens. This added a layer of magic as a visitor explored the garden and stumbled upon beautiful design features which were not visible upon their perceived view from the rear of the chateau. The garden is also much larger than it had appeared. Lenot also utilized perspective to play with shapes. A pool which had appeared ovular from the chateau due to foreshortening is actually circular upon approach. As the visitor approaches the canal, they see that the grotto, which appeared to be at eye level from the chateau, is in fact below them. Past the canal, the garden ascends to a large lawn. Many of the garden's design features became fixtures of the Jardin à la Française, such as water basins and canals surrounded by stone curbs, fountains, gravel walks, sculpted hedges, patterned flower beds, and grottos. The underlying theme was combining the best of nature with the best of man-made design. The superintendent's home proved to be a bit too luxurious. While Fouquet's attentions were to flatter the king, the plan backfired. King Francois Premier had Fouquet arrested and imprisoned for life for misappropriation of public funds. However, the king must have admired the chateau because he confiscated tapestries, statues, and trees and sent them and the team of artists, Laval, Lenotre, and Lebrun, design his own palace and gardens of Versailles. And that's it for this presentation. I hope you've enjoyed learning all about the French Renaissance Chateau.